And we're going to continue with the 14th chapter of Oversea Under Stone. Barney has found the grail and brought it out to Simon, who found a roll of parchment inside, which is too delicate to touch. Jane just discovered that the tide was coming in. The boys have come out of the cave, and we will pick up from there. Hello, Simon said foolishly, sounding dazed. His matches had run out, fu out five full minutes before they reached the light, and the last part of the way had been a nightmare journey in the pitch dark, walking blind and trusting the feel of the lion to tell them that the way ahead was clear. He had made Barney let him go first. All the time, he felt that every next step might bring him crashing against rock or face to face in the dark with some nameless thing, and he would not have been surprised when they emerged to find that all his hair had turned white. Jane only looked at him with a small wry grin and said as he had, Hello. Look, Barney said and held up the grail. Jane felt her grin widen with delight. Then we've beaten them. We've got it. Gosh, I wish Gummery were here. I think it's made of gold, Barney rubbed at the metal. Out in the sunlight, the grail seemed far less magical than the mysterious darkness of the cave, but a bright yellow gleam showed here and there through the dirt on its side. There's a sort of pattern scratched all over it, too, he said, but you can't see properly without clearing it up. It's terribly ancient. But what does it mean? I mean, everyone's trying like mad to get hold of it, because it can tell them, them something. But when you look at it, there doesn't seem to be anything it could possibly tell anyone, unless the pattern's some kind of message. The manuscript, Simon said. Oh, gosh, yes! Barney took the small heavy lead tube from the cup and showed Jane the manuscript inside. This was wedged in the grail. It must follow on from where our manuscript leaves off. I bet it's tremendously important. I bet it explains everything. But it breaks up almost as soon as you look at it. He carefully fitted the cup back on the tube. We've got to get it home safely, Simon said. I wonder if there's room. Wait a minute. He took the telescope case from under Jane's arm and unscrewed it. Their old familiar manuscript stood up from the lower half, fitting it closely. Simon took the dark leaden cylinder and dropped it carefully inside the center of the parchment in the telescope case. There, got a hanky, Jane. Jane took her handkerchief from her shirt pocket. What for? Like that, Simon said, fitting the handkerchief in a tight ball inside the top of the parchment roll. It'll keep the new one steady. We'll have to run if we're going to get off before the tide catches up with us, and it'll get back and it'll get bounced about a lot. Automatically, Jane and Barney turned to look again at the sea. And at exactly the same moment, each of them gasped with a noise of pure, strangled fright. Simon had bent his head to screw the two halves of the case back together. He looked up quickly. The waves were lifting the seaweed now within six feet of where they stood. But that was not what was wrong. Jane and Barney, arrested in mid-movement, were looking farther out to sea. For a moment, in one jutting rock of... For a moment... The one jutting rock obscured Simon's view. Then he, too, saw the tall, sweeping lines of the yacht Lady Mary under full sail come round the end of the headland toward them. And he, too, saw the tall, dark figure standing on the bow with one arm raised, pointing. Come on, quick! He grabbed Barney and Jane as they stood motionless with shock and pushed them ahead of him. They jumped and slithered over the seaweed-cushioned rocks, away from the cave and the pursuing yacht. Barney clutched the grail in one hand as he ran, his arms outstretched to keep his balance. Simon held the manuscripts in their case grimly to his chest. He glanced back over his shoulder and saw the great white mainsail of the yacht crumpling down to the deck and a small dinghy being lowered over the side. Barney slipped and fell and nearly brought them both down on top of him. Even as he fell, the grail did not leave his grip, but struck the rock once more with the same clear bell-like note as before. It rang out over the sound of their splashing, hasty feet. He struggled up again, biting his lip at the sting of salt, eating into a graze on his knee, and they hurried on. They were splashing through water all the while now. The waves had grown and were washing right over the rocks with every pulse of the rising tide. The water masked the pools and hollows with drifting brown weed and glossed the bare rock with a swirling coat that would turn soon into a current strong enough to dislodge their quick, desperate feet. Barney slipped away again and fell with a splash. Let me take it. No! He scrambled for a foothold. Jane, pulling him up by his free arm, and the frenzied nightmare of the race drove them faster, zigzagging in wild, blind leaps over the wave-washed rocks. 
Simon glanced back again. Two figures in a small dinghy were paddling fast toward them from the yacht. He heard the yacht's engines cough into life. Go on, quick, he gasped. We can still do it, they hastened on, half stumbling, half keeping their feet only by their own speed. Still, there was no sight of the beach around the headland, but only the sea on one side and the great wall of cliff rising on the other, and before them, dwindling into the tide, the long path of rocks and weed. Stop! A deep voice rang across the water behind them. Come back, you stupid children, come here! They won't catch us, Simon panted, catching Barney as he almost fell a third time, and jerking him back to his feet. Jane, at his side, was sobbing for breath at every step, but running and stumbling with the same desperate haste. Then round the headland, in front of them, something else came into sight, and dropped their hopes like stones to the bottom of the sea. It was another dinghy, brought as a tub, breasting the waves like a barge. The boy Bill sat at a chugging outboard motor in the stern, and Mr. Withers was leaning eagerly forward in front of him, his long dark hair blowing in the wind. He saw them and shouted with triumph, and they saw an unpleasant grin break on the boy's face as he turned the boat's nose toward the rocks in their path. They skidded to a halt, appalled. Which way? They'll cut us off. They cut us. They'll cut us off. But we can't go back. Look, the others are going to land. At the edge of the water, creeping round their feet as they looked distractedly back and forth, not ten yards ahead, the boat with Mr. Withers, evilly smiling, was heading to cut off their path. And behind them, the other dinghy was bobbing almost at the edge of the rocks. They were caught neatly in a trap. Come over here, the deep voice called to them again. You will not get away. Come here. Mr. Hastings was standing up in his dinghy, a tall black figure with one arm out toward them with his legs planted apart to keep him balanced, swaying with the boat's rise and fall on the swell. He looked as if he were straddling the sea. Barnabas! The voice dropped lower to a hypnotic monotone. Barnabas, come here. <clears throat> Jane clutched at Barney's arm. Don't go near him. No fear. Barney was frightened, but not bewitched into obedience as he had been before. Oh, Simon, what can we do? Simon stared up at the cliff wondering for a wild moment if they could climb to shit to safety, but the sheer granite face towered implacably up, far, far above their heads. They could never have found footholds there, even to climb out of reach, and they would have fallen long before they reached the top. Barnabas! The voice came again, gentle, insidious. We know what it is you have in your hand, and you too, Simon, Oh, yes, Simon, especially you. Simon and Barney each closed a hard ins a hand instinctively tight around the manuscript and the grail. They are not yours, the voice rose more roughly. You have no right to them. They must go back where they belong. Mr. Hastings was watching them intently, poised in the dinghy, waiting for the next mo moment of the swell to jump across the rocks. Only the heaving mounds of seaweed masking the edge made him hesitate. At the tiller, Polly Withers was struggling to control the boat in the rising waves. Barney shouted suddenly, You can't have them! They're not yours either! Why do you want them anyway? You haven't really got a museum! I don't believe all the things you said! Mr. Hastings laughed softly. The noise echoed eerily and spined chillingly over the gentle murmur of the sea. <laughs> You'll never win properly, Simon called defiantly. You never do. We shall this time, a lighter voice said behind them. They swung round again. It was Withers. The outboard motor had cut off, and quietly, the other dinghy was edging nearer to them as the boy Bill groped for the rock with an oar. They drew closer together with their backs against the cliff, pressed as far away as they could, but on either side the boats crept closer toward them. The Lady Mary was edging slowly along, along off the headland. They could hear her engines thrumming faintly, though they could not see no one on board. If only we had a boat, Jane said in despair. Couldn't we swim for it? Where to? There must be something we can do, Barney's voice rose frantically. There is nothing you can do. With his light, sneering voice came over the rocks to them. He was less than five yards away in the boat, 
of the tossing in the bow of the tossing dinghy. Give us the manuscript. Give it to us, and we will take you off safely. The tide is rising very fast now. You must give it to us. And if we don't, Simon called rebelliously, look at the sea, Simon. You can't get back now the way you came. Look at the tide. You're cut off. You can't get away unless you come with us. He's right, Jane whispered. Look, she pointed farther along the rocks. The sea was already washing the foot of the cliff. Where's your boat, Simon? called the mocking voice. We'll have to give in, Simon said, low and angry. Take your time, Simon. We can wait. We've got all the time in the world. They heard the boy snicker on the other side of the boat. They've got us. Oh, think. Think. We can't give it up now. Think of great Uncle Mary. It's a pity we never thought we ever thought of him in the first place, Simon said fiercely. It's no good. I'm going to say we give in. No, Barney said urgently and before they realized what was happening, he had snatched the manuscript case from Simon and splashed forward over the wet rocks to the edge of the sea. He held up the long, glittering case in one hand and the grail in the other and gazed furiously at Mr. Hastings. "'If you don't pick us up and let us take them home, I shall toss them. I shall throw them into the sea.' "'Bonnie!' Jane croaked, but Simon held her back, listening. Mr. Hastings did not move. He stood, looking across with immense calm arrogance at Barney's small, bristling figure, and when he spoke, the deep voice was colder than any voice they had ever heard. "'If you do that, Barnabas, I shall leave you and your brother and sister here to drown.' They had no doubt that he was speaking the truth, but Barney was carried away with a passionate indignation, and he was determined never again to believe anything that Mr. Hastings said. If once he did, he knew he would be under the spell again." I will, I will, if you don't promise, I will. He raised the grail higher in his right hand, flexing his muscles to throw it. Simon and Jane gasped. The whole world seemed to stop and center round the towering black-clad man and the small boy, one will against another, with Barney saved by his own fury from the full force of the commanding glare driving into his eyes. Then Mr. Hastings' face twisted and he let out a strangled shout, Withers! And from that moment, for the children, the world cracked into unreality, and there seemed no reason to anything that happened. From either side, Norman Withers and Mr. Hastings made a dive for Barney. Simon shouted, Barney, don't! and dashed toward him to clasp his outstretched arm. Withers, nearer, made a great leap onto the rocks from his boat, setting it swaying wildly, with Bill clinging frantically to the tiller, but as his lunging foot came down where the rock should have been, they saw the viciousness of his face change to alarm, and he flung up his arms and disappeared under the water. He had jumped down on the masked pool among the rocks, the gap where the retreating sea had left deep water, and which was now filled far deeper by, an incoming t by the incoming tide. Jane, cowering back against the cliff, chilled with horror as she realized that they would all three have gone headlong into it if they had run another yard further on. Withers surfaced again, coughing and spluttering. And Barney hesitated. The grail still held over his head. Mr. Hastings had leapt across to the rocks without falling and was coming at him from the other side with long, loping strides, his dark brows a menacing bar across his face and his lips drawn back in a horror, unlaugh in a horrible, unlaughing grin. Simon dived desperately and was brushed aside by the sweep of one long arm. But in falling, he grabbed at the man's nearest leg and brought him crashing down at full length on the wet, slippery rocks. For all his height, Mr. Hastings moved like an eel. In a moment, he was on his feet again, with one big hand clasped round Simon's arm. And in a swift, cruel movement, he pulled the arm round behind Simon's back and jerked it upward so that he cried out with pain. The girl in the boat laughed softly. She had not moved since the beginning. Jane heard and hated her, but stood transfixed by the look of concentrated evil cruelty on the face above her. It was as if something monstrous blazed beneath Mr. Hastings' eyes, something not human that filled her with a horror more vast and dreadful than anything she had felt before. And there we will pause.